Good morning, church. Will you stand with us as we worship together this morning? We're going to have a great Sunday in God's presence. Can we put our hands together? Break into the wild and don't be afraid. Run into wide open spaces, graces waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted, graces waiting with a spirit. that in your presence we can worship you with freedom and with joy this morning you are worthy of praise Lord Jesus we love you Lord we love you Jesus 
I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Oh, your name is Sing it out. Your name is love, Jesus. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadow. Burn like the fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. To every soul held captive by depression, oh, I speak Jesus. Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Oh, Jesus, for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. We you lift your voice and declare Jesus over your life today? Come on, church. Shout Jesus from the mountains. And Jesus in the streets, and Jesus in the darkness, over every end. Jesus for my family, Jesus for my family, and I speak the whole name of Jesus. We lift up the name of Jesus, hallelujah, shout Jesus from Whatever you might be facing today, won't you give it to Jesus? Jesus. 
Come on, lift it up to the Lord. Lift up his name over what you might be facing. Jesus, we give it all to you. Oh, we send Jesus. I speak Jesus over my family. Oh, Jesus. Come on, let the name of Jesus resound in your home today, here in church. Oh, I speak Jesus. Faithfulness is true, and we're desperate for. 
on church in praise and it's you Jesus and it's you that we adore as we lift our voice and sing hallelujah singing with the saints and the angels we sing to Jesus hallelujah singing hallelujah hallelujah who is singing today. Come on, lift up your praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It's you we adore, Jesus. It's you we adore. You are worthy of all the praise, Jesus. You are worthy of all honor. How can we not but sing praises to your name, Lord Jesus? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we pray as we just feel you in this place today, Holy Spirit, that you will just come and move in a special way in our lives. We thank you that you are El Shaddai, more than enough, the sufficient one, the one who provides. But there's nothing more we need, Jesus, than you. We love you. We thank you that you are true to your word and that you come when we lift up our songs of praise and you enter in and you take over and you touch our hearts. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. You are worthy. You are worthy. Thank you that you are here. Bless us today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, let's give Jesus praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's great to see you all. Thank you for coming to church today. Thank you, Pastor Ryan. Over to you. Before you sit down, please just turn around, wave, to say good morning. So great to see you. And then you're welcome to sit down. Thank you, church. Good morning, everybody. Good to have you here. Thank you, Freddie. Just um, good morning to all those in person in the church this morning and also to all those online. We have uh, three or 400 people watching us every week online and we just greet you from wherever you are all over the world. I know of a special couple in Germany who watch faithfully every Sunday and uh, just welcome to, to you too. If it's your first time um, in person, there's the guest station in the foyer, and you can go, go there and collect a, a guest pack, please, and also have a cup of tea on us and something to eat. But please, if you're here for the first time, we'd love to get to know you. And if it's your first time online, please go to the Connect card and let us know that, that you're visit, visiting us. We had, um, we've had some new people join our church in the last two months. And I'm going to just see their lovely faces. Yes, they're going to come up on the screen shortly. And um, this is our new member in intake. And I'm just going to going to pray. And I just welcome you on behalf of Chris and Lisa and the team. There we go. Th those beautiful faces. And yes, give them a clap. We rejoice in everyone joining new life. 
we've been through a pandemic and we're in a rebuilding phase and we just welcome with open arms anyone who wants to join with us. And we're grateful to have you here. So let's pray for these precious people. Oh, in Jesus' name, Father, thank you for these dear, dear people who you've sent to New Life Church to, to worship you and serve you with us. Lord Jesus, ask your grace upon them, Father, that your workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do the good works that, you've, that you have um, ordained for them to do. Precious Holy Spirit, help each one. Help them to find their place here, Jesus, and just to love being here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we have got water baptism. The Bible is big on water baptism, and so are we. And so we have our water baptism class on Thursday, the 24th of March at 7 p.m. It's online, and uh, we don't do baptisms online. We do the class online, but uh, the, the baptisms will be about a week or two after that. But we're very, very serious about um, wanting people who are baptized to know what they're doing biblically and to have a full, a, a good enough understanding of what they're doing. We just don't want to tick a box. We want to make sure that, that you, you know what it's all about. So if you feel the tug of the Holy Spirit to get baptized, we'd love you to join. Then Freedom in Christ course, that is on Friday the 25th of March at 7 p.m. and Saturday the 26th of March at 9 a.m. It's a beautiful course. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. And we all need the freedom of Christ and progressive freedom in Christ. And just come to that, um, that course and you'll find breakthrough. And, it's, and even if you've done the course before, you can do it again. And it's, 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 it's a beautiful course. And baby dedication. We love babies. We love growing the church with adults and with children. And we have a baby dedication class on Thursday, the 31st of, Ma of March at 7 p.m. So if you've had a little baby in the last couple of months and you, or last year and you haven't had your baby dedicated yet, we'd love to do that. Come to the class again, like the water baptism. We like to make sure that we, we do it biblically and properly and it's not just a box to tick, that you know what you're doing when you're dedicating your child. And uh, the dedication service will be a, a week or two after that. Giving is part of our worship, and um, I was just thinking this morning that God sees the hearts when we give. And some of us are in a space after the pandemic where we're not able to give, and 10% of naught is naught. And God sees that heart of, um, of people who want to give but can't. And uh, God sees the heart of those who do give. And just, just on behalf of Chris and Lisa and the team, thank you for your generosity to New Life Church. I'm gonna say a prayer and the faithful ushers will serve, serve the uh, congregation this morning in receiving the offering. And then we will watch uh, the TV news and get ready for Pastor Chris's next uh, session on wisdom. Dear Father, thank you in Jesus' name for all that you do for us. Lord, thank you for the sun you bring up on us every morning and the sun you take down on us every night. Lord, may your name be praised from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same. Father, thank you that you give us all things richly to enjoy. Thank you, Father, for our salvation which, with which there is no price. And thank you, Father, for your goodness and kindness to each one of us. In Jesus' name. Whether you're with us in person or online, we're so glad you're joining us. A lot of great things are happening here at New Life. Here are just a few. To stay connected with all that is going on, visit newlifechurch.co.za. Follow us on social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or sign up for our newsletter. If you'd like to give today, you can give via the offering bag visit the giving station situated in the foyer and regardless of where you are you can always give online at newlifechurch.co.za we have so many opportunities for all ages to grow connect and be encouraged to learn more stop by the welcome center situated in the foyer or visit newlifechurch.co.za no matter where we gather in person or online here or there we are new life together thanks again for joining us today
Well, good morning. I don't know about you, but directly after that worship moment, I just felt, hey, listen, we could just park here and uh, <laughs> just continue worshiping and could actually even go home. Um, just what we encountered together as a church is uh, something so beautiful, something so pure, something so special. When the people of God gather around the person who deserves all our worship, all our devotion, all our praise, and that's Jesus. And when, as we were singing, Lord, we're waiting on you. I just saw us waiting on the Lord, serving Him, loving on Him. You know, someone once said it this way, the highest form of faith is praise. You wanna know a person who's full of faith, see how they praise. And in these days, so often we can look at the circumstances and I get that we're human, but I really believe the Lord is calling us to be a people of great faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. The Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. The way we're gonna overcome some of the mountains in our lives is by the power of faith. And uh, God is looking for people that will have that simple childlike trust in a God that is almighty and working in us, amen. And he is for us. And if he is for us, who can be against us? And so let's keep on being a praising people every time the enemy might shoot the fiery darts, the Bible says, of the evil one. We put up the shield of faith and we keep on marching, amen, all into the beautiful things that he has for us. And so we love you, Jesus. Worship you, Jesus. At the end of the service, what we're gonna do as a congregation, we're gonna gather as we are around the Lord's table and just for us to reflect on the wonderful, wonderful cross on what Jesus has done for every single one of us because he loves you and values you and everyone online. Everyone online, warm welcome to you as Ryan has already said. Also just wanna say thank you to Ryan and Fern and the beautiful Alpha Ministry. Did you mention anything about the Alpha Ministry? Yes, this last weekend, Friday night, Saturday, a whole group of people were here at church. Uh, they've been tracking together through the Alpha program and uh, this weekend is known as the Holy Spirit Weekend. Uh, where they have an encounter with the precious presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And so, God bless you all. Thank you to the Alpha team. Thank you to everyone who's attended it. And uh, God has begun a good work in you, and He'll be faithful to complete it until the day of His return. We're looking at wisdom. I believe it's something that we need in these days. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of our times, and that the Lord would be our true treasure. And I believe that's a word for all of us, that all of us need to grow in the power of wisdom. And Jesus was the all wise one. Proverbs written by a wise man called King Solomon. And uh, it's in the book of Proverbs. And we've said that uh, wisdom is, not, is more than just being moral and good. It's more than that. Uh, it's uh, knowing the right thing to do in the majority of life situations where the commandments don't necessarily apply. Like for example, who you're gonna marry, uh, what job you're gonna pursue, should you stay or go, and all the different decisions that we're gonna make on a daily basis. And so it's all about being competent, skilled with regards to the realities of life, that we're not in denial about the realities, they're challenging realities, they're beautiful, glorious realities, and intersecting those and hearing the heart and the mind of God to handle the various realities in our life. And so this morning, we're gonna look at a very important subject for every single one of us. And uh, <laughs> I wish I as a pastor wasn't having to preach it because the moment a pastor's talking about this, I understand that some people think, oh, okay, wait a minute, it's a pastor. Well, can you just forget that it's a pastor? And this is just Chris, fellow shepherd, fellow brother in the faith, but this is the Lord's word speaking to us. And uh, it's all about the power of money. All right, we can, now go, on, we can go now, you can go. For those who wanna go, you can go. It's what wise people know about money. You know, I was saying to Lisa in the car this morning, I said, you know, Lee, you know, as I'm doing this series, obviously I've said it to so many of you over the years that sometimes I'm, I'm learning as much as you are in the process. And there's certain principles you look back and you think, oh, wow, I just wish I'd known those principles from Proverbs a little bit earlier. But it's never too late to learn. Never too late to learn and to grow in the things of God and that's what's happening. We work some progress in the Lord's at work in us and if we will be not just hearers of the word but doers of the word, wow, 
I believe it creates uh, more meaning in life and greater growth, greater potential and all those things. So what do the wise know about the power of money? And that's what we're gonna look at today because hey, every one of us can be foolish in this area and God wants to help us walk in wisdom. And so the wise know a few things. They know the power of money. Uh, they know the reasons for the power of money, why money is so powerful. And then they also know how to break the power of money in their lives. They're not addicted to it, not in the grip of it, not tormented and in control by it. Jesus, it's interesting. Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, He talks in and around money more than any other subject, even more than prayer, which is beautiful and precious. And by the way, I just wanna acknowledge uh, SJ and the rest of the wonderful team, how they just, every single Wednesday morning, leading us in prayer through uh, Facebook Live. And if you're not aware of it, every, eight o'clock, every Wednesday morning, eight o'clock, you can log in and just join in our beautiful prayer moments. But here Jesus, he begins to speak in and around money because he knew the thing that can grab your heart and my heart, heart so easily is the power of money. And he knew it wasn't just about money, it was a heart issue. It was a spiritual issue. And Proverbs, interestingly, recognizes the power of money by talking about how good it is. You'll see so many different verses in Proverbs talking about wealth creation in the most positive possible means. And just to look at some of the scriptures, just a few because of time, Proverbs 10 verse four says, lazy hands make a man poor, but diligent hands bring wealth. Now that's not saying anybody that's poor is lazy, sometimes we know that can be as a result of injustice, et cetera, but there's a principle there. Proverbs 10 verse five, he who gathers crops in summer is wise. He who sleeps during harvest time is graceful, disgraceful. Proverbs 10 22, the blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. Proverbs 21, 20 says, the wise man saves for the future. The foolish man spends whatever he gets. And so here you see how the book of Proverbs connects hard work, creativity, insight, understanding, skill, discipline, uh, saving, investing, with with prospering economically and materially. Nothing wrong with it. And so in one sense, there's an impression when you read Proverbs that you get this impression it's all about making money, which actually it isn't, but the other side, and there's a balance to this whole thing, Proverbs is based on the understanding of the book of Genesis that there is a creator God who's created this universe and also created this beautiful planet called Earth with people to inhabit it, and yeah, he creates it beautifully. Uh, it's a good earth, it's a beautiful earth, it's there to be enjoyed. He puts man and woman in the garden, in on earth, to look after this earth, watch over it. He says, be fruitful, be multi- multiply. Here, yeah, this, there's this beautiful abundance. He says, I'm wanting you to grow it. I want you to prosper it. I want you to increase what I have. Keep on growing it and begin to take care of one another, take care of this earth, take care of people. And so in one sense, Proverbs is us going on the whole Genesis principle that work is not a curse word, it's also there to, it's a blessing, it's part of our calling in one sense, they can be enjoying it, but there's a responsibility in us to take care of others and to take care of the earth. And so the more of money you have, the more, not only are you gonna take care of yourself, but it's also to take care of the common good, to take care of others. And so it's very humanizing, it's beautiful. You're not just a cog in the, in the, in the, in the machine. The purpose of life is to know God. It's not just about making money to own things for yourself, but it's also about sharing and taking responsibility on the earth. And so here, Proverbs will talk about the balance. It'll talk about planning. It'll talk about budgeting. It'll talk about saving. And we'll talk about sowing and just so many different aspects to the area of money that's so important to all of us. It'll talk obviously about the inherent goodness about money, but it'll also talk about the dangers, the good side of money, but also the bad side of money. And uh, there's a spiritual danger to it. 
And there's just some areas, this is a subject that we could camp on for the next few weeks around this area, we're not, but uh, money, we got a beautiful course, by the way, called Financial Hope, which is a fantastic course put together by amazing people in the area of finance to help people get out of debt and all those things. But here are four areas where we can see part of the, the bad side of money, the danger to the lure and power of money. One is money has the power to corrupt our integrity has the power to corrupt integrity. Some people who are honest, moral, good people, sometimes in the presence of a lot of money, can all of a sudden lose their integrity over the power and lure of money. Proverbs 11 verse one says, the Lord abhors dishonest scales, but accurate weights is his delight. Dishonest scales. What's it saying? Well, in ancient times, the seller might label a one kilogram weight uh, as two kilograms, place it on the scale, so, which leads the buyer to buy more grain than he actually really was getting. And so this was deceptive business practices. And here, the writer of Proverbs, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, hey, Lord, the Lord dishonors or abhors, it hates deceptive, corrupt business practices. Um, a wealth that's made people dishonest. Proverbs 20 verse 17 says this, stolen bread tastes sweet, but it turns to gravel in the mouth. In other words, wealth gained by fraud will never ever satisfy. Going back to this Proverbs where it says the Lord abhors dishonest scales, actually some translations say it's an abomination to the Lord. It's an abomination to the Lord. That the Lord actually hates deceptive practices, dishonest business practices. He hates greed. He hates materialism. This is the heart of the Lord because he knows how it corrupts us and hurts us. Money also and others. Money has the power, it's the second danger to it. Money has the power to magnify self-absorption to the detriment of the community. The social fabric that it has the power in one sense for us to be so focused on ourselves that we ignore the community. We ignore the needs around us. We're so focused on looking after ourselves. Proverbs 11 verse 25 says, people curse the one who hoards grain, but they pray God's blessing on the one who's willing to sell. And so here, the picture is, this is describing a man in times of food scarcity. He's holding onto his grain so he can push the price up. People are suffering and starving, but he's holding onto the grain. Now what he's doing is not illegal, it's not uh, uh, dishonest, but it's ruthless. It's, he's self-absorbed, he's just thinking of himself. There's no rule that could say, no, you've got to sell something. He can hold on to it if he wants. But again, it's ruthless. And so here, by holding on to it, the scripture's saying the person's cursed. He's being cursed. And so there's a, when we talk about someone being cursed, it can be a spiritual, emotional, moral, physical disintegration that can take place to that person. And so in one sense, Proverbs is condemning a business that only has one bottom line, and that's to make personal profit. Nothing wrong with making profit. A business to survive has to make profit. But here it's speaking into this when it's a business that only has one bottom line. We have to make more money. We have to, it's all about personal profit. Proverbs is actually saying, no, that's not my way. Yes, you've got to make personal profit. And so if we know from God's perspective that he is ultimately the owner of all things, um, We've been put on this earth with, with nothing, actually, in one sense. We had the given life and oxygen, free air and all these things, but we put on this earth. We come in with nothing, but here we have a relationship with the Lord. God is actually the owner of it all. We're called to be stewards of all He gives us. And so what we're gonna realize, if we're gonna look at what wise people know, is that they have multiple bottom lines. One is, yes, profit, but also to be a blessing to the community. It's also thinking about the common good of the community. And so again, like I've said, we understand that a business has to make profits, but it's also these multiple bottom lines. The word righteous in Proverbs has 
different meanings, but one specific meaning uh, in this context is the person who is righteous not only is in right standing with God, but what righteous really means is it's a righteous person is people that value community as a bottom line in production as well as personal growth. So they're finding the balance in that. Proverbs 10 verse 18 says, the wages of the righteous, the upright, those in right standing with God, is a worthwhile, meaningful life. The income of the wicked, punishment. And so the righteous are those people who are not only thinking for themselves, they're not self-absorbed. Yes, they need to have their needs met, obviously, and we've got to be balanced in this, but also they're also thinking of how we can build up the community and not just themselves. Whereas the unrighteous person, the unrighteous person is gripped, let's say, by the power of money, the spirit of greed and things like that. They just make it for themselves, spending it on themselves, never thinking of others. Why? Because in one sense, We've been lured by the power of money. All right, so that's another danger when you look. These are things that we all know, but the scripture just needs to remind us on this. Another danger is money, how it affects us. Money has the power to distract you from what's really important. And yes, uh, we know that in being in Johannesburg, we're hardworking and uh, we understand that diligence is an important aspect of life. But wealth, in one sense, is the power to absorb all your time, your imagination, your energy, so you have too little left to really focus on sometimes what's really important. And nobody on their, their deathbed said, listen, I wish I could just get back to the office. I wish I could just make some more money as they're about to cross from this life into God's eternal presence. Proverbs 11 verse four says, wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath. The day of wrath is a judgment day, judgment day. Every single human being will one day face God who is the ultimate, perfect, holy judge. Every person, every president, every king, every queen, every business person, you name it, every single person that you can see on TV today one day will, be, will have a judgment day. And in the day of that judgment day, there's certain questions we had to ask ourselves. Who, what, what, who, and I think it can prepare us to the judgment day. Obviously, Jesus Christ being the key of who we're living for. Are we living for Jesus? Are we living for our own kingdom? Living for ourselves? Living for Him? Living for others? Um, who is your God? Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Have you followed his plan? What difference am I making in the world? At, li- at the end of life, hey, listen, it's not what you've got, but also what you've given, how, how you and I have built up, how we've added value to people, how we've added value to the kingdom of God. And so wealth, it's so easy to blind us from the judgment day questions. What have you done with what I've given you? And so I think so often it's easy to fall into this frantic cycle of, of consumption. And uh, we're on this rat race and we think the stress is high. We, you know, we, you earn more and then you spend more. And then as you're spending more, you think, okay, now I need to earn more and then I'm spending more. And so all of a sudden we're getting into this frantic cycle, just creating a lot of stress for us. And on and it goes. And then we start feeling strapped, stressed, trapped, I don't have enough to keep up and there's, there's just not enough for, for, to, to spread around. And, and, and it's so easy for us to all fall in this kind of trap. And then another area is money can make you proud. Money can make us feel better than others. It can make us feel overconfident. Listen to what Proverbs 30 verse eight and nine says, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Who is he? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. And so here's one of the ultimate dangers of wealth as we get to the place where the lure and power of money has made us just feel like, hey, well, who do I need? why do I even need the Lord? I've made it on my own. Who's he? 
And so there's nothing like economic success to, 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 to uh, allow us to become wise in our own eyes. And Proverbs will say, when you're wise in your own eyes and you think it's all about you, and, you know, the Bible says that's the essence of foolishness. And so there's something about where the more successful we got, we get with this thing, well, I've got it, I'm, I'm smart, I'm super disciplined. And yes, there's a part of truth to that. You've obviously applied your acumen and your business skill and, and you've worked hard, et cetera, get that. But the moment we get to the place, and this is the power and the danger of money, well, who is God? And since when you go to some wealthy nations, you get to people who think that I don't even need God. It becomes such a secular nation because, hey, wait, we've got all our needs met and, you know, there's safety nets, etc. So who cares? Who needs God? And that's a danger for all of us. The Bible says, what profits a man if he gains the whole world? Think about that. Gains the whole world. All the property you care to name, all the pleasures you care to name. What profits a man if he gains the whole, but lose, gains the whole world but loses his soul? Your soul priceless. Making money does not make you a great judge of character or wise about anything. It shows that how easy money can, it can, it can lure us. In fact, there was a guy called Bernard of Claveau, Claveau, I think is the way to find it. To see a man, he said, humble under prosperity is the greatest rarity in the world. Now, does that say, now again, we've said, we've got to look at various verses and Proverbs to try and bring a complete picture. Does it mean that God says, listen, none of you can ever be wealthy? No. Does it mean that people who do have wealth deny God? No. There are a lot of beautiful, precious, rich people that understand, that, listen, unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor, labor in vain, they know it's for the grace of God and they've got a close relationship. So again, let's see the balance. Now, so it's so easy for us to underestimate the power of money. There's the good side, there's the, the dangerous side, the bad side, but why is it so powerful? Why is it that for every one of us, it can actually affect us in good ways, but can actually lead us in wrong ways? Why, why does it have this ability to make us overconfident or overwork, or it, it can destroy our integrity and character? We can be self-confident, can distract us from really what's important. What is it? Proverbs tells us one of the main reasons, and this is what it says in Proverbs 10 verse 15. It says the wealth of the rich is their fortified city. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city, but poverty is the ruin of the poor. Now if you go back several hundred years ago, cities were the ultimate places of security ultimate place of security. If you, the most secure place to live was a house within a city surrounded by walls. That was your protection. It was protection from wild animals. It was protection from wind storms. It was protection from uh, uh, invaders and vigilantes and all the other things. So if you lived in the city, you felt really secure. Every, wanted to, every person wanted to live within the city walls. And so you had the rich that would live in the city. People who are arts and skilled lived in the cities, but the poor, they had no protection. Vulnerable to the invaders and, and wild animals and windstorms and all those things. And so the riches were not just the place of security, but they, 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 they were also the place of significance. If I could just live in the city, surrounded by walls, then I'm gonna feel important. Then I'm gonna feel like I've made it. Then I'm gonna feel significant. And so to live within the city and one sense satisfy two big human needs, the need for security and the need for significance. And so it was a source of security and significance. Now notice what Proverbs 10 verse 15 says. It doesn't say the rich live in the city, but they did. It says the wealth of the rich is their fortified city. In other words, the wealth of the rich it's the riches, it's, it's their city, it's their identity. The temptation to make riches the source of our security and significance, our ultimate source of security and significance. And so here Proverbs is mainly saying, look, people can look to wealth for their significance and people can mainly look to wealth for their security. People who look to wealth for their security they put their money into savings, investments, and Proverbs will talk about, yes, there's wisdom in that. But where Proverbs is going a little deeper in this particular perspective is some people, and I understand this for all of us, I have some money, so therefore I feel safe. As long as there's cash in the bank, I'm gonna feel safe. 
and I have some form of control. And in one sense, that's the ultimate form of safety. Whereas the scripture will say, listen, there's nothing wrong with save, saving, but money can never be your ultimate security. It cannot. Then some people look to money for significance. It makes me feel cool. It makes me feel better than others. The, in terms of the, the cars I drive, the, the clothes I wear, the place I live, the people I connect with, the places I eat and all those things, that in one sense makes me feel significant and super important. Proverbs 18 verse 10 will say this, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe, are safe. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it an unscalable wall. This is the ultimate source of security and significance. Now the big danger for all of us, and I think many of us can relate to this to some degree, is no more reasonable way to feel really good about yourself and good about your life than wealth. If I said, listen, at the end of the service, every one of you are, given, are gonna be given $100 million. Whew, just me saying that makes me feel I wanna start singing. <laughs> You'd feel tremendously good, right? But here, what Proverbs is saying, wealth is an alternative to God. Because so often, we're looking to wealth as our ultimate source of security and significance rather than God. Wealth doesn't mean, doesn't just make you happy in some general way, it gives you your identity and it gives you your security. The problem is obviously, what happens when the wealth is no longer there? Like happened in the Great Depression where multimillionaires were jumping to the death, why? Because, and I'm not judging this, but the principle was, one sense, some of them had made wealth, their security, their significance, and now, because it was their identity, their walls were in rack and ruin, and ruin, there's nothing, me, nothing left of me le left. There's no me left. Proverbs 11 verse 28 says, those who depend on their wealth will fall like the leaves of autumn. But for the wise, there's something about the wise, they understand the power of money is good the dangers. They understand though, the fear of the Lord is their treasure. Listen to Isaiah 33 verse five, and I believe this is a word for us as a congregation in your life. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times and the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. That the real treasure, Jesus is the one who makes you and I feel ultimately significant and secure. Money is worthless in the day of wrath. Very important, yes, we gotta build wisely. We understand it, but money cannot stop you from spiritual death. It can't stop you from becoming spiritually free. It can't stop you from having heartache. And so here, the writer of Proverbs is saying this, money, more than anything else in this world, offers to you significance and security apart from God. And wise people recognize it. So what do we do about it? What do we do about it? How do we break this addiction to money, break the power of money, the, the grip of greed? How, how, how do we break free from it? Because sometimes it's one of the, you know, you, it's easy for us to say, well, I'm angry or I'm, de but sometimes it's hard for us to say, well, look, I'm a little bit selfish or I'm a little bit greedy. And here the scripture's coming and dealing with our own hearts. And sometimes we realize we've confused needs and wants and we've made, we just, we, what we think is a, a need actually is really a want. And that's where we, we, we spread ourselves a bit too thin and we're spending more than we earn and get ourselves into trouble. And most of the debt often is not caused by needs, it's caused by wants. And listen to what Proverbs 27 verse 20 says, human desires are like the world of the dead. There's always room for more. Ecclesiastes, also written by Solomon, wisest and richest man at the time, he who loves money shall never have enough. The foolishness of thinking that wealth brings happiness. The more you have, the more you spend. What's beautiful about Proverbs, it'll talk about this 
beauty of money, the power of money, the balance of money, and the bad side, the good side. But it'll also say for the wise person who's learned to break the power of money, guess what? They they begin to make better, smarter economic decisions in the long run because they're not under the power of money. They recognize its value and how important it is. So how are we gonna break it? Well, I think firstly, for most of us, maybe we look in the mirror and think, okay, Lord, maybe I've been in denial somewhat. I have been, you know, the essence of foolishness is ignoring realities. Wisdom is competence with regards. Lord, maybe I've been a bit in denial about the lure and the power of money. Okay, it's a starting place for us. Secondly, we need to understand that we find true happiness, true meaning is not in possessions, in pleasures, beautiful things, good things, but in giving and helping others. So actually, when we begin to allow giving breaks the grip of greed. Believe me, this is what Jesus said. Acts 20 verse 35, Jesus said there's more happiness in giving than in receiving. Proverbs 22 verse 9 says this, one who is generous will be blessed because he gives some of his food to the poor. So here in the scripture, and there's so many other scriptures, not just in Proverbs, around the whole scriptures, but generosity to God and to the poor is a key way for all of us to break the power of money and it'll make you wiser in your financial dealings. When it says the generous will be blessed because they share their food with the poor, they can be spiritually poor, people who are materially poor. The blessing here is the increase in love. It's the increase in real riches. It's the increase in the true wealth of love. That radical generosity actually, now it's not saying you shouldn't save and be wise with your money and all that stuff. Please remember we always want the balance around the scriptures, but radical generosity is an act of love toward God and toward others that actually increases true riches which is love. The greatest value is love. That we're growing in those relations, we're growing in impacting the community, impacting other people's lives. It's seeing money not as a currency of status and power, but rather as a currency of loving God and loving others. That you are now becoming a conduit, a channel of God as you being blessed and God's meeting your needs and yes, you're growing your, your area but in it that we are starting to see ourselves as channels by God to send resources to those people he loves. He loves the world that he sends Jesus. That we send money to the poor, send our resources to the poor. We send our resources also to the building of the kingdom of God. Why? Because it begins to spread one of the greatest messages in all the world, the greatest message, the love and the presence of Jesus that people can encounter that and it begins to change our lives. And so we become more blessed the way and when we become more like Jesus in the way God is. He so loves that he gives. Now, before we close this, before we go into time of communion, there is this principle called, the principle called the scattering gathering principle. The scattering gathering principle. Proverbs 11 verse 24 says, there is one who scatters, yet he increases more. And there's one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. And this is a paradox. In fact, even Psalm 112 will talk about this scattering, gathering principle. And so he who scatters, gathers, and when you gather, you also begin to scatter. And the more you scatter, the more you gather. And so there's this principle. But if you hold it to yourself, the Bible's saying it begins to dissipate. Just like a farmer, this was an agricultural term. As as farmer knows, he sows, he scatters seed, and the more he sows, the more he begins to reap. And so there's the scattering, gathering principle. If he holds onto a seed, then he starves. And so any wise farmer knows the value of scattering, and as he's scattering, ultimately he begins to gather. And it's always in a better form. It's a, he reaps a harvest, something that he can enjoy, and also that something can, that can also be used to benefit those around him. 
And so spiritually wise people realize that money is a seed. It's a seed. And the only way to turn it into real riches is to be a generous person. Now for those who immediately think, hey, Chris, we're not taking an offering after the service. Just say no, okay? So, to calm down. Uh, really, you know when I say something like it, I think I'm talking to one person because 99.99% of the new lifers, I believe, get this. This is not a promise that the more you give, the more money you will make, but that may happen, but you'll begin to grow in true wealth, true blessing. And you begin to help ministries that help people spiritually and physically, and it's the real wealth of changed lives. Well, I've played a role in ministering to people and people being transformed by the loving gospel of Jesus Christ and also helping poor people in their journey. Now, finally, in order for us to break the power of greed, the power of money over our lives, so we walk, we're, not, we're free of it, we, we're not controlled by it, we're not tormented by it, I believe, yes, we're gonna understand the scattering, gathering principle, but we also gotta to look to Jesus and have a revelation of who Jesus is and what he's done on the cross, because I believe when we understand what happened at the cross, it actually breaks the power of money over our lives, where we can actually begin to make smarter, wiser choices around our, fund, our money. Paul the Apostle will be talking to a church, Macedonia, there's needs for the poor, people are needing the gospel to get out, etc. And he begins also sharing this whole gathering, scattering principle. And he says this in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, he says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for the sake, your sake, he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And then he goes on to say this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And then he says this, as it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. And so what Paul, the Apostle Paul, is teaching this church, he's saying, you wanna know the ultimate gathering or scattering gathering principle? Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus, what he does as he's going to the cross, he is flogged 39 times by cats of nine tails, broken into pieces, torn into pieces, talking about a scattering, scattering, He's being scattered for you and I. Scattered, why? So he could gather you and I. He's laying down his life, scattering his own life as a seed so that ultimately he can gather you and I. Why is he doing it? Because he loves us. And Paul is wanting the church to recognize this. And when you see the ultimate act of generosity, the ultimate act of scattering and gathering, and what Jesus has actually done for you, guess what happens? It's gonna liberate us from the power of money. Money is still important, but it's gonna liberate us from its power. Why? Because the cross, the ultimate act of generosity is your ultimate security and, 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 and significance. The cross, the ultimate act of generosity is your ultimate security and significance, not money. Money is important, but it's not the ultimate Security, it's not the ultimate significance. Jesus, the cross and what He's done for us. And that starts to change us inwardly. It begins to change our identity. It changes our approach to living life. Because why? If you believe in the cross, then you know God cares for you. And that's a security that many can't give you. Eternally right with God, that I have God Almighty, the one who owns a thousand, the valley of a thousand hills, all the cattle, you name it, the stars, the planets. He cares for me. It's a security money can't give me. And if I believe in the cross, it's a significance that money can't give me. Why? Because why would Jesus Christ leave all the treasures of heaven, leave heaven to come to earth, gives up his own glory so he can gather you, gather me, He's prepared to scatter his life, empty his life so that he can have you and me as he gives his life for the cross. Because why? He says, you are significant to me. What makes you and I significant is that we are significant in the eyes of God, that you're important to God, that you're valuable to God. And that's what starts to work inside me and you. I begin to understand, oh, he loves me so much. He died for me because he values me. 
and I can have eternal security in Him. I can understand that I'm important, valuable, not by what the world says, but what Jesus says. And then my heart is melted by His great act of generosity, His act of love. And until that becomes your significance and security, you and I will never be free of money because we'd always look to money as the ultimate thing when Jesus and His love and the cross, what He did for you is our ultimate act, our ultimate security and significance. If you and I treasure anything else in life other than Jesus, Jesus first, guess what happens? Our treasure will drive us, dominate us, control us. It will demand that you die for it. Terrible ruler, great servant, terrible ruler. But here, Jesus, when He's our treasure, we realize, wait a minute, He dies for you, dies to get you, to gather you, to have an eternal relationship with you. And so New Life, I believe what we do is just begin to reflect on what Jesus has done for us to recognize that your significance and your security is not found in money. There's a deeper foundation to knowing how much He loves you and that you have a life with Him. He's caring for you. He's giving us wisdom. Yes, He's calling us to be a generous people. Proverbs talks about there's one who withholds more than is right. And I'm gonna say this, and I know it might not be popular for some. What it's saying is, there's one who's gathering and scattering and gathering, scattering and gathering. You just never stop scattering, but you're also gathering in the process, growing in true wealth of love and blessing and all those beautiful things, but there's someone who's always withholding. Why? Because sometimes we're in fear, and I get that. But sometimes what, it's the stingy person that's holding with what's right. From a biblical perspective, it's, I believe, giving. Many scholars would say this. It's giving to the kingdom of God. We are part of the glorious church. Jesus is building His church. He's about His church. You can't say, well, I love Jesus and I hate the church. No, it's the body of Jesus. And so, as the principle of percentage giving, a tithe, I believe maybe some of you are thinking, well, Christian, you know what? I, I've had nothing to give. I'm gonna encourage you today. Make a decision in your life. I don't care if you give it, but make a decision, start giving. Start to say, listen, I'm gonna start somewhere. Even if it's half a percent, one percent, start. I tell you, because sometimes some of us don't know how this power of money, it's, it's, it's driving us silly. But here the Lord, Jesus is saying, hey, happiness is found, blessed life is found in giving more than receiving. It doesn't mean you don't enjoy the receiving, but there's something beautiful, and it's the power of generosity. It's sacrificial giving, but God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. God is a cheerful giver. Jesus gave himself away, and look at his harvest. You, me, millions and millions and millions of people who have the life and the love and presence of Jesus inside of them. Why? Because He's scattered and He's gathering and He's calling us to do likewise and make an impact in this world. Can we bow our heads just for a few moments? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you this morning? Maybe there's just one phrase today or one word or something that happened in the service and the Lord is speaking to your heart right now. Jesus says, I'm the shepherd and my sheep hear my voice. Some of us maybe just to say, Lord, I Acknowledge, Lord, I, I've allowed this thing. I know the stress, and Lord, we, we're in so much trouble. And Lord, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this financial pit. Jesus is saying, I want to help you out of that. I want you to have looked to me. I am Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, your provider. Can you see me as your source? your security and your significance and your provision. I know about the sparrows. I know about the lilies of the field and you know, 
take care of the sparrows. You are so much more valuable than sparrows. But look to me. Build your life on me and your, the rock, on the Word of God, on Jesus and His will, His Word, His ways. Some of us have tried to do it our ways and we just thought we know better. And God's saying, no, He knows better. Would you surrender to Jesus in this? And I'm not just talking about tithing and all that stuff. People can just tithe and some of still get it all wrong in terms of their perspective. And so I'm talking about a bigger picture here. To see Jesus as Lord of your life, Lord over your finances, Lord over your family, Lord over your career. That we'd be a righteous people. Yes, we all need to grow in this. That our hearts would increase in an awareness of the your kingdom, of your presence, and those around us. That Jesus, there was something about you, Lord. You were just so loving and so generous and Use us, Lord, to make a difference to those around us. And Lord, I pray for miracles for people, Lord, in areas where acknowledge, Lord, maybe unwise choices have got us there. But Lord, redeem us, restore us in this. Lord, even if we're not going to despise small beginnings, but Lord, we're going to get back up. We're going to move forward in your plans in Jesus' name. Amen. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna, before we go, we're gonna have communion, but we're gonna sing this beautiful song and you should receive communion if you didn't. The communion emblems, please just raise your hands. The ushers will come give it to you. And then at the end of the song, we're gonna finish off by praying and partaking together. before you now as honestly as I know how broken by the days gone by spirit help my soul to rise best but still I fail and even then you're with me there you remind me I'm a child of God regardless of the things I've done my hope is found in perfect love your kindness Lord your kindness leads us to repentance to the heart of God your heart oh God is all say that it's impossible to ever save a sinner's soul but my God says to the prodigal my beloved
Think about it the other day. Jesus says, You give your life, give your life, I'll give you real life. Unless your life falls like a seed to the ground, you'll never ever gain true life. I kind of thought, you know, I'm a Durban boy and love the ocean. And I thought, if can you imagine a, the ocean looking at a fish You're sitting on earth and saying, on land, saying, Listen, the ocean says, Listen. I'll give me your life and you'll have life. And the fish says, no, no, no. Sorry, I'm gonna live on earth. I'm gonna live on land. No, the way a fish survives is living in the ocean. In the same way, the way we live part of the abundant life is giving our life, yielding ourselves to the life and the love of Jesus. It's the way we live. Jesus gives his life to you, says you and I can have life. And now he says, hey, listen, give your life and you'll have abundant life. You can't lose can't lose and so can we just bow our heads just for a few moments his mercy does triumph over judgment I deserved eternal separation from God every one of us sinned and fallen short of the glory of God but oh because of his grace and mercy he steps in takes the punishment you and I deserve because he loves you and he sees you and I the joy of being with him for all eternity and the relationship starts now as we yield to Jesus someone here 
is just to call on Jesus, your heart. Maybe he's been backslidden or you've never accepted Jesus, Lord and Savior. Just say, Jesus, save me from my sin. Jesus, be my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Jesus, I make you Lord over my heart, my life. Come in and be my Savior and my King. If we just take the bread representing Jesus' body that was broken for you and I. Ultimate sacrifice, sinless sacrifice takes the sins of the world so that we can find forgiveness and be in right standing with God. Greatest act of love because He loves you. And so can this moment we just examine our hearts and who is Lord in your life? It's a moment for us just to freshly surrender everything to Jesus. Maybe there have been some things that have been clutching for first place and Jesus saying, no, seek me first in my kingdom and my righteousness. And then all these things will be added unto you. I'll take care of your needs. Jesus, we thank you for the price. Just how I receive your life, your healing, your presence, Jesus. Let's partake of the bread. Maybe someone watching right now, someone in this building, as you just partaking of the bread, you felt like I cannot get out of this thing. Oh, I'm so broken and busted. Pray as you're just ingesting this, this bread, that the life and the healing, the virtue of Jesus, the healing of Jesus, setting you free healing you, giving you perspective. There's a way. He makes a way where there seems to be no way. Look to Him. Let Him heal you and let Him heal your perspective. The cup of the new covenant. God's a covenant keeping God. When you are on a covenant with Him, it's everlasting. And nothing can separate you from His love for you the blood of Jesus that washes away all our sin and the only thing that gets me into the presence, the throne of grace is not my good works but the blood of Jesus thank you Jesus for your blood forgiveness of sin that you went for the, to the cross for us we love you Jesus, we worship you, we thank you for what you've done for us on the cross proving your ultimate your love that we secure and significant in you for all the days of our lives on this earth and ultimately when we're with you forever. Pray, Lord, for your protection and your grace and peace to be ministered to every person here. In Jesus' name, you love us, Lord, unconditionally. Amen. Love you, new life. Have a glorious day, a glorious week. Our prayer teams will be available in the front. Some of you may be sensed the touch, presence of God, and you need to come forward just for fresh and filling or staying in the gap for somebody. Please come forward. If you prayed the prayer of salvation with free Bibles to help you in your journey with Jesus, and if you're new here, we'd love to connect with you over a cup of coffee out in the entrance for you. Love you all. God bless you.